of my fine, featherless friends. We are continuing with Dear Mr. Henshaw by Beverly Cleary. We're on page 61, which, if my math is correct, brings us pretty close to being halfway done. Not quite halfway done. Pretty close. From the Diary of Lee Botts, Saturday, January 20th. Dear Mr. Pretend Henshaw, Every time I try to think of a story, it turns out to be something... Some, it turns out to be like something someone else has written, usually you. I want to do what you said in your tips and write like me, not like somebody else. I'll keep trying because I want to be a young author with my story printed, mimeographed. Maybe I can't think of a story because I am waiting for dad to call. I get so lonesome when I am alone at night when mom is at her nursing class. Yesterday, somebody stole a piece of wedding cake from my lunch bag. It was the kind catering by Katie packs in little white boxes for people to take home from weddings. Mr. Friendly noticed me scowling again and said, So the lunch bag thief strikes again. I said, Yeah. And my dad didn't phone me. He said, Don't think you are the only boy around here with a father who forgets. I wonder if that I wonder if that is true. I wonder if this is true. Mr. Friendly keeps an eye on just about everything around school, so he probably knows. I wish I had a grandfather like Mr. Friendly. He's so nice. Sort of baggy and comfortable. Monday, January 29th. Dear Mr. Pretend Henshaw, Dad still hasn't phoned, and he promised he would. Mom keeps telling me I shouldn't get my hopes up, because Dad sometimes forgets. I don't think he should forget. What he wrote on a postcard, I feel terrible. Tuesday, January 30th. Dear Mr. Pretend Henshaw, I looked in my book of highway maps and figured out that Dad should be back in Bakersfield by now, but he still hasn't phoned. Mom says I shouldn't be too hard on him because a trucker's life isn't easy. Truckers sometimes lose some of their hearing in their left ear from the wind rushing past the driver's window. She says truckers get out of shape from sitting long hours without exercise and from eating too much greasy food. Sometimes they get ulcers from the strain of trying to make good time on the, on the highway. Time is money for a trucker. I think she's just trying to make me feel good, but I don't. I feel rotten. I said, if a trucker's life is so hard, how come dad is in love with his truck? Mom said, it's not really his truck he's in love with. He loves the feel of power when he's sitting high in a cab controlling a mighty machine. He loves the excitement of never knowing where his next trip will take him. He loves the mountains and the desert sunrises and the sight of orange trees heavy with oranges and the smell of fresh mown alfalfa. I know because I rode with him until you came along. I still feel terrible. If dad loves all those things so much, why can't he love me? And maybe if I hadn't been born, mom might still be riding with dad. Maybe I'm to blame for everything. Wednesday, January 31st. Dear Mr. Pretend Henshaw, Dad still hasn't phoned. A promise is a promise, especially when it's in writing. When the phone does not ring, it is always a call from when the phone, let me try that again. When the phone does ring, it is always a call from one of the women mom works with. I am filled with wrath, in parentheses he writes. I got that out of a book, but not one of yours, in parentheses. I am mad at mom for divorcing dad. As she says, it takes two people to divorce. So I am mad at two people. I wish Bandit was here to keep me company. Bandit and I didn't get a divorce. They did. Thursday, January 1st. Dear Mr. Pretend Henshaw, today there, today there was bad news in the paper. The sugar refinery is going to shut down. Even though dad hauls cross, cross country now, I keep hoping something, sometime, he might haul a really big load of sugar beets to Speckles. Now, maybe I'll, maybe I'll never see him again. Friday, February 2nd. Dear Mr. Pretend Henshaw, I am writing this because I am trapped in my room with a couple of babies sleeping in baskets on my bed. Mom has some of her women friends over. They sit around drinking coffee or herb tea and talking about their problems, which mostly men, which are mostly men, money, kids, and landlords. Some of them piece quilts while, they're talk, while they talk. They hope to sell them for extra money. It is better to stay in here with the babies than go out, and, go out and say hello. Sure, I like school fine. Yes, I guess I have grown and all that. 
Mom is right about Dad and his truck. I remember how exciting it was to ride with him and listen to calls on calls on his citizens band radio. Dad pointed out how hawks sit on telephone wires waiting for little animals to get run over. So they won't have to bother to hunt. Dad says civilization is ruining hawks. He was hauling a gondola full of tomatoes that day. And he says that some, some tomatoes are grown especially so they are, they are so strong they, they won't squash when loaded into gondolas. They may not taste like much, but they don't squash. That day we had to stop at a weight scale. Dad had used up enough diesel oil so that his load was just under the legal weight and the highway patrol didn't make him pay a fine for carrying too heavy a load. Then we had lunch at, at a truck stop. Everybody seemed to know Dad. The waitresses all said, well, look who just rolled in. Our old pal, Wild Bill, and things like that. Wild Bill from, from Bakersfield is the name Dad used on his CB radio. When Dad said, meet my kid, I stood up as tall as I could so they would think I was, go I was going to grow up as big as Dad. The waitresses all laughed a lot around Dad. For lunch, we had chicken fried steak, mashed potatoes with lots of gravy, peas out of a can, and apple pie with ice cream. Our waitress gave me extra ice cream to help me grow like Dad. Most truckers ate real fast and left and left, but Dad kidded around a while and, and played the video games. Dad always runs up a high score, no matter which machine he plays. Mom's friends are collecting their babies, so I guess I can go to bed now. Sunday, February 4th. Dear Mr. Henshaw, I hate my father. <sighs> Mom is always home on Sunday. But this week, there was a big golf tournament, which means rich people have parties. So she had to go squirt, squirt devil crab into about a million little pu cream puff shells. Mom never worries about meeting the rent when, when there is a big golf tournament. I was all alone in the house. It was raining, and I didn't have anything to read. I was supposed to scrub off some of the mildew on the bathroom walls with some smelly stuff but I didn't because I was mad at mom for divorcing dad. I feel that way sometimes, which makes me feel awful because I know how hard she has to work and try to go to school too. I kept looking at the telephone until I couldn't stand it any longer. I picked up the receiver and dialed dad's number over in Bakersfield. I even remembered to dial a one first because it was long distance. All I wanted was to hear the phone ring in dad's trailer I try that again. All I wanted was to hear the phone ringing in dad's trailer, which couldn't cost mom anything because nobody would answer. Except dad answered. I almost hung up. He wasn't off in some other state. He was in his trailer and he wasn't, and he hadn't phoned me. You promised to phone me this week and you didn't, I said. I felt, I felt I had to talk to him. Take it easy, kid, he said. I just didn't get around to it. I was going to call this evening. The week isn't over yet. I thought about this. Something on your mind, he asked. I didn't know what to say, so I said, my lunch. Somebody steals the good stuff out of my lunch. Find him and punch him in the nose, said Dad. I could tell he didn't think, think my lunch was important. I hoped you would call, I said. I waited and waited. Then I was sorry I said it. I have some pride left. There was heavy snow in the mountains, he said. I had to chain up, highway, had to chain up on Highway 80 and lost time. From my, back, from my map book, I know Highway 80 crosses the Sierra. Sierra, I also know about putting chains on trucks. When the snow is heavy, truckers have to put chains, chains on the driving wheels, all, 18, all eight of them. Putting chains on eight big wheels in the snow is, not, is no fun. I felt a little better. How's Bandit, I asked, as long as we were talking. There was a funny silence. For a minute, I thought the line was dead. Then I knew something must have happened to my dog. How's Bandit, I asked again, louder in case Dad might have lost some of the hearing in his left ear from all that wind rushing by. Well, kid, he began. My name is Lee, I almost yelled. I'm not just some kid you met on the street. Keep your shirt on, Lee, he said. When I had to stop along with some other truckers to put on chains, I let Bandit out of the cab. I thought he would get right back in because it was snowing so hard, but after I chained up, he wasn't in the cab. Did you leave the door open for him, I asked? Big pause. I could have sworn I did, he said, which meant he didn't. Then he said, I, whist I whistled and whistled, but Banda didn't come. 
I couldn't wait any longer because the highway patrol was talking about closing Highway 80. I couldn't get stranded up there in the mountains when I had a deadline for delivering a load of TV sets to a dealer in Denver. I had to leave. I'm sorry, kid. Lee. But that's the way it is. You left Bandit to freeze to death. I was crying with anger. How could he? Bandit knows how to take care of himself, said Dad. I'll bet dollars to donuts he jumped into another truck that was leaving. I wiped my nose on my sleeve. Why would the driver let him in, I asked. Because he thought Bandit was lost, said Dad. And he had to get out, of, out with his load because the highway was closed, the same as I did. He couldn't leave a dog to freeze. What about your CB radio, I asked. Didn't you send out a call? Sure I did. But I didn't get an answer. Mounts cut down on reception, Dad told me. I was about to say I understood, but here comes the, par the bad part, the really bad part. I heard a, boy, a boy's voice say, hey, Bill, mom wants to know when you're going to get the pizza. I felt as if my insides were falling out. I hung up. I didn't want to hear any more. When mom had to pay for the phone bill, phone, phone call, I didn't want to hear any more at all to be continued. Monday, February 5th, dear Mr. Henshaw, but then he crosses it out. I don't have to pretend to write to Mr. Henshaw anymore. I have learned to say what I think on a piece of paper, and I don't hate my father either. I can't hate him. Maybe things would be easier if I could. Yesterday, after I hung up on dad, I flopped down on the bed and cried and swore and pounded my pillow. I felt so terrible about Bandit riding around with a strange trucker and dad taking another boy out for pizza when I was all alone in the house with the mildewed bathroom, when it was raining outside and I was hungry. The worst part of all was I knew I knew if dad took someone to pizza to a pizza place for dinner, he wouldn't have phoned me at all, no matter what he said. He would have too much fun playing video games. Then I heard mom's car out in front. I hurried I hurried and washed my face and tried to look as if I hadn't been crying, but I couldn't fool mom. She came to the door of my room and said, hi, Lee. I tried to look away, but she came closer in the dim light and said, what's the matter, Lee? Nothing, I said, but she knew better. She sat down and put her arms around me. I tried hard not to cry, but I couldn't help it. Dad lost bandit, I finally managed to say. Oh, Lee, she said, and I blubbered out the whole story, pizza and all. We just sat there a while, and then I said, why did you have to go and marry him? Because I was in love with him, she said. Why did you stop, I asked. We just got married too young, she said. Growing up in that little valley town with nothing but sagebrush, oil wells, and jackrabbits, there wasn't much to do. I remember at night how I used to look out at the lights of Bakersfield in the distance and wish I could live in a place like that. It looked so big and exciting. It seems funny now, but then it, se then it seemed like New York or, or Paris. After high school, the boys mostly went to work in the oil fields or joined the army, and the girls got married. Some people went to college, but I couldn't get my parents interested in helping me. After graduating, your dad came along in a big in a big truck, and, well, that was that. He was big and handsome, and nothing seemed to bother him. And the way he handled his rig, well, he seemed like a knight in shining armor. Things weren't too, weren't too happy at home with your grandfather drinking and all. So your dad and I ran off to Las Vegas and got married. I enjoyed riding with him until you came along and, well, by that time I had enough of highways and truck stops. I stayed home with you and, and he was gone most of the time. I felt a little better when mom said she was tired of the life on the road. Maybe I wasn't to blame after all. I remembered too how mom and I were alone a lot and how I hated living in the mobile home. After the only, sorry, about the only places we ever went were laundromats and the library. Mom read a lot and she used to read to me too. She used to talk a lot about her elementary school principal who was so excited about reading, she had the whole school celebrate books and authors every April. Now mom went on. I didn't think playing pinball machines in a tavern on Saturday night was fun anymore. Maybe I grew up and your father didn't. Suddenly, mo suddenly mom began to cry. I felt terrible making mom cry, so I began to cry some more. And we both cried until she said, it's not your fault, Lee. You mustn't even think that. You mustn't ever think that. Your dad has many good qualities. 
we just got married too young and he loves the exciting the excitement of the life on the road and i don't but he lost bandit i said he didn't leave the cab door open for him when he when it was snowing maybe bandit is just a bum said mom some dogs are you know remember how he jumped into your father's cab in the first place maybe he was ready to move on to another truck she could be right but i didn't like to think so i was almost afraid to ask the next question but i did mom do you love dad do you still love dad please don't ask me she said i didn't know what to do so i just sat there until she wiped her eyes and blew her nose and said come on lee let's go out so we got in the car and drove to the fried chicken place and picked up a bucket of fried chicken then we drove down by the ocean and ate the chicken with rain sliding down the windshield and waved and waves breaking on the rocks there were little cartons of mashed potatoes and gravy in the bucket of chicken but someone had forgotten the plastic forks we scooped out the potatoes with chicken bones which made us laugh a little mom turned on the windshield wipers and out out in the dark we could see the white of the of the breakers of the breakers we opened the windows so we could hear them roll in and break one after another you know said mom whenever i watch the waves i always feel that no matter how bad things seem life will still go on that was how i felt too only i wouldn't have known how to say it so i just said yeah then we drove home i feel a whole lot better about mom i'm not so sure about dad even though as she says he has good qualities i don't like to think that bandit is a bum but maybe mom is right tuesday february 6th today i felt so tired i didn't have to try to walk slow on the way to school i just naturally did mr friendly had already raised the flags when i got there the california bear was right side up so maybe mr friendly didn't need me to help him after all i just threw my lunch down on the floor didn't care if anybody stole any of it by lunchtime i was hungry again and when i found my little cheesecake missing i was mad all over again I'm going to get whoever steals from my lunch from my lunch then he'll be sorry i'll fix him or maybe it's a her either way i'll get even i tried to start a story from for young writers i got as far as the title which was ways to catch a lunch bag thief a mouse trap in the bag with with all i a mouse bat trap in the bag was all i could think of and anyway my title sounded too much like mr henshaw's book Today during spelling, I got so mad thinking about the lunch bag, bag thief that I asked to be excused to go to the bathroom. As I went out into the hall, I scooped up the lunch bag closest to the door. I was about to drop kick it down the hall when I felt a hand on my shoulder and there was Mr. Friendly. What do you think you're doing? He asked, and this time he wasn't being funny at all. Go ahead and tell the principal, I said. See if I care. Maybe you don't, he said, but I do. That surprised me. Then Mr. Friendly said, I don't want to see a boy like you get into trouble, and that's where you're headed. I don't have any friends in this rotten school. I don't know what I, why I said that. I guess I felt I had to say something. Who wants to be friends with someone who scowls all the time, asked Mr. Friendly. So you've got problems. Well, so is everyone else. If you take the trouble, the trouble to notice. I thought of Dad up in the mountains, chaining up eight heavy wheels in the snow, and I thought of Mom squirting deviled crab into hundreds of little cream puff shells and making billions of tiny sandwiches for golfers to gulp and wondering if catering by Katie would be able to pay her enough to make the rent. Turning into a mean-eyed lunch kicker won't help anything, said Mr. Friendly. You gotta think positively. How, I asked. That's for you to figure out, he said, and gave me a little shove towards my classroom. Nobody noticed me put the lunch bag back on the floor. Wednesday, February 7th. Today after school, I, I felt so rotten I decided to go for a walk. I wasn't going to any place special, just walking. I had started down the street past the paint store and antique shops and bakery and all those places on the path on past the post office when I came to a sign that said butterfly trees. I had heard a lot about these tre those trees where monarch butterflies fly thousands of miles to spend the, the winter. I followed arrows until I came to a grove of mossy pine and, a euc and eucalyptus trees with, with signs saying quiet. There was a big sign that said, warning, $500 fine for molesting butterflies in any way. I had to smile. Who would want to molest butterflies? 
The place was so quiet, almost like a church, that, that I tiptoed. The grove was shady, and at first I thought all the signs about butterflies must be for some, for some kind of ripoff for tourists, because I saw only three or four monarchs flitting about. Then I discovered some of the branches looked strange, as if they were covered with, like, with little brown sticks. Then the sun came out from behind a cloud. The sticks began to move, and slowly they open, opened wings and turned into orange and black butterflies, thousands of them, quivering on one tree. Then they began to float off through the trees into the sunshine. Into the sunshine. Those clouds of butterflies were so beautiful. I felt good all over and just stood there watching them until the fog began to roll in and the butterflies came back and turned into brown sticks again. They made me think of a story mom used to read me about Cinderella returning for, from the ball. I felt so good, I ran all the way home and while I was running, I had an idea for my story. I also noticed that some of the shops had metal boxes and said, that said alarm system up near their roof. So does the gas station next door. So does the gas station next door. I wonder what is in those boxes. All right, we're going to continue again on the next video.